Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, it's our, our prayer that God has continued to bless you and your family, um, that God has continued to bless your work and your ministry, and that you continue to live your life in a way that glorifies God. Uh, thank you so much for joining with us this uh, day, and I pray that God has... Uh, that you've enjoyed you know moments of our praise and worship and that god has already even been speaking to you and just um that you are encouraged to know that you are loved by god and and god has a purpose uh through everything that is going on even in your life right now uh, over the last few weeks we have been uh working working through a series uh, just reflecting on the topic of pain and suffering but looking at that in the context uh, and through the lenses of the word of god and just saying you know what does god say about this because all of us, at one point or the other, you know, either we have been through, we have experienced suffering and pain, or we are experiencing it, or someone around us right now is going through a moment of pain and suffering and confusion, and they just cannot understand maybe what's going on, or it's going to come. You know, that's a guarantee that we have, all of us, because all of us will or uh, are going through suffering. And, you know, with, when you think about suffering, we talk about the universality of suffering. You know, suffering affects everyone. It knows no boundaries. It does not know race. It does not know status. It does not know religion. You know, everyone at one point or the other, you know, will experience or will know someone who is experiencing, you know, and, and, and just will experience suffering at some point or the other in their lives. And so we've been just looking at what the Word of God says. And I pray that, you know, God has been speaking to you. If this is your first time today, I hope that you can just go back into our different channels and you will find, you know, for the last uh, three weeks what we've been talking about and uh, Pastor Dave and Lillian uh, handled uh, some wonderful teachings for us, which I may not have enough time right now to go through. But just being reminded again, uh, where is God in, in, in our suffering? And that's what Lillian was talking about last week. And just being reminded that, you know, God has promised he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. So even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of the mess and the confusion and the challenges that you find yourself in, God has promised to always be with you and you can trust him in that. He never promised that he will take us away from some of these challenges, but that even when we go through them, God will always be with us. And so today I just want to pick up from there and just to... Uh, Talk about, you know, um, what's God's purpose in our suffering? Is there, could it even be that uh, there's a purpose that God wants to fulfill and achieve through our pain and suffering? Um, and so that's the question that we want to deal with. And as I said again, you know, all of us will experience or are experiencing or have experienced pain, in one, suffer, pain and suffering in one way or the other. And, you know, I was, I was just listening to someone who said, you know, pain, you know, like because of that, you know, he said many of us, Maybe you went to a doctor and they gave you this report about this condition. And they said, you know, pain and suffering has made, you know, historians and archaeologists of most of us, even without knowing, because we've gone to dig information about situations, you know, about, you know, maybe financial distress or maybe this kind of sickness or this kind of challenge and try to get as much information, thinking that maybe, you know, we can kind of figure out, you know, maybe you have this condition of someone in, in your family and so you, you find yourself just trying to gather as much information as you want, you know. But then these, these are just realities that we have to deal with. Uh, but the most important thing I want to say, especially for you who's listening to us today, is that your knowledge of God, or even the lack of knowledge of God, influences our response when we experience pain and suffering. Um, and, and so it's very important that we uh, know God and that God, God's word shapes our worldview and our perspective and how we respond in moments of pain and suffering. Because many people have responded differently. You know, we, we, we think about Job and even in his family. You know, Job decided to persevere. He decided to wait and just say, God, what is your purpose through this? But for his wife, his perspective was different. And he just said, you know, probably for her, God was just there to serve us for our time of good. And when pain came, you know, it's like, just ask God and die. And that may be the philosophy of some of us to think that God is just there to work for our good and, and not... To, to understand the bigger picture of how God is working through our lives. So I pray that God will just help you. Um, and, and for us to know, you know, for, for us th that know God, um, it's, it's important for us to just go back and see, you know, what's God speaking to us through his word? And as, as revealed to us also through, as God has revealed himself also through his son, what is it that we can learn from his word, from the life of Jesus? Um, and especially even including these areas of pain and suffering, and how God works. And one of the things we know for sure is the Bible says that all things work for the good of those who love God. Those who have been called according to God's good purpose. And this includes 
pain and suffering that it all works for our good so this is this this just gives us perspective so that we can understand and the bible helps us to know why god allows challenges into our lives as, as his children it may not give specifics about to every detail of the issues that we are facing but the bible kind of helps us to know why god allows us as his children to experience some of these challenges in our lives you know and, and just to realize that pain is not always a curse you know suffering is not always you know bad you know i was reading some books some years back by philip yancey and in one of these books he talks about uh, a doctor who was working with lepers, people who are suffering from leprosy. And if you know something about leprosy is that, you know, there's a way that it numbs someone's body, that they cannot feel anything. And so for, for this doctor, he says, if he can help a, someone suffering from leprosy to feel pain, that is a blessing. Because they, they, they are numbed, and therefore their body cannot feel any pain. And so they continue to just, you know, their body continues to, to be chopped off without even feeling anything. And so for us, he says, therefore, that pain, it's actually a blessing. When you feel pain, it helps you to know it's a sensor in your body to point to you that something needs to be needs attention. Maybe when you have a headache, it, it's a pointer that there is something that's not right with you. When, when you feel some pain in some certain place of your body, it is a sensor and an indicator to you that something. So pain is not always bad. There's, there's blessings in, in this pain. And that's what we just want to think about. So what are the purposes of suffering as we look at it through the scripture? There are several things, and, 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 and I may not explore everything, but I, I just want to ask you to, again, be a good student of your word and just read through the scriptures. But, you know, Job, after going through all that he went through, Job actually, in, in Job chapter 42, verse 1 to 6, helps us to realize that there is a purpose that God wants to fulfill, even through this. And he says, you know, the, the, the Bible says, Job chapter 42, from verse, verse 1 to 6, it says, Then Job replied to the Lord, he says, I know that you can do all things. And he says, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Points us that, you know, Job comes to realize they, there was a purpose through all this. And verse 3 says, you ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Verse 4 says, you said, listen now, and I will speak. I'll question you, and you shall answer me. And he says, my ears had heard of you. But he says, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, Job ultimately comes to this point. You know, after going through immense pain and, and suffering, you know, even his friends could come and they didn't even have much to comfort him because the pain was just too much. And, and, and some of them had their own perspective. You know, maybe they sin, maybe there's something. But, you know, he went through it and finally says, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He says, you know, and, and he says, you know, God asks, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? And ultimately Job says, you know, because of going through this, he says, I had heard with my ears. But he says, now my eyes have seen you, God. So I pray that God will help you. Whether you are just right now in the midst of something or when some, you, know, you find yourself in the midst of something, that you will not forget that God is with you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, one of the guys who suffered greatly you know, during the Nazi, you know, he wrote and one of his writings he says is that when we go through challenges in our lives, he says the enemy does not bring to us a hatred for God, but he says it brings a forgetfulness of God. And I think that's why the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know that we will not forget in the dark what God has revealed to us in the light. That we will always remember who God is and that we will not forget, you know, the power and the goodness of God even over our lives. So the first point I just want to point out is you know, like the, what are some of the, you know, what's God's purpose in our suffering is that number one is that God uses suffering to remind us that we are living in a fallen world. You know, that this world is not our home. That this, this world is just, you know, we're just in transit. You know, and so you may be wondering, so what comfort or what benefit do I get by knowing that I live in a fallen world? It's because also to realize that nothing that happens in our lives happens by accident. That the happenings that happen around our, our lives is not a result of fate because some, some of our worldviews think that, you know, I cannot change, you know, it's fate. And so that's how it is. You know, the things that you go through in your life is not because God's plans have failed or God has failed. No, I think that's what this reminds us. Because if it was true that what's happening in our lives 
and what happens to us is a result, you know, it's just something that has happened just by accident, that is just something that is a result of fate and we don't, we don't have anything about it, or that maybe God's plan has failed, you know, then that leaves us in a very precarious position. It leaves us in a place of hopelessness and powerlessness. But then, thank God that the Bible says all things work for the good of those who love God and those who have been called according to God's good purpose. You know, we as children of God understand that everything happens within a bigger picture of God's great grand plan that he has in our lives. So if, if you read in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, you know, the Apostle Paul paints a very good picture for us here. And he says that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. And he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. He says, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may always be manifested in our bodies. You know, it just talks about, you know, the fragility, the frailty of our, our lives as human beings. And he uses this to, 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 to use the picture. He says, you know, we are like jars of clay, you know, in the Palestinian context where this was written from. You know, pots, you know, were very ordinary, common things that were used every day. But then, you know, they were easily broken, they were easily available. But then he says, you know, we have these treasures. God has put the treasure, you know, in the knowledge of himself. And God has just entrusted us with great, you know, revelations and truths and, and so much that God is doing in our lives. But he says, he uses the picture in this jar of clay. That our lives are fragile. That our lives here on this earth is fleeting and just temporal. You know, and he says the reason why God is doing that is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And so this is just a reminder for us. That, you know, as we go through things, we read through the Bible and realize, as you read through the Bible, you realize that God and the Bible is not surprised by the things that you go through. You know, suffering does not, you know, the Bible does not deal with, demonstrate any surprise, any frustration, any, any disappointment, any dismay, you know, concerning suffering. Rather, as you read through the Bible, realize that suffering is presented to us as a normal experience for every child of God as we live our lives between after the fall and before the second coming of Jesus. So as we live in between here, after the fall and before the second coming of Jesus, pain and suffering is part of the deal. It's part of our experience. And so the, the Bible is not surprised. If that was the case, then, you know, there will be, there, that will be a challenge for us. So everyone in the Bible, as we even read through, it doesn't matter how closely they walked with God. They also experienced and went through pain and suffering. And, you know, most of them, too, have just passed away. You know, all of them have gone through. And so this is just a reminder to us. God uses this to remind us that we are living in a fallen world. This is not how God intended for things to happen. This is not God's original plan. And that's why we see before the fall and after the second coming of Jesus, we see God's perfect plan for how he intended for you and I to enjoy life in the presence of God. And that is the blessing that we have in Jesus Christ. And even as we go through the things that we go through, to know that ultimately, you know, we can focus our eyes as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can, we, like Jesus, know that there is so much that lies inside of us if we but only endure and persevere. So God has not failed. His plan has not failed. And we have not been left to figure out life by ourselves because sometimes that's the, that's the lie that the enemy wants us to think about when things don't go, don't go the way that we expect. When we find ourselves in very intense you know, challenges in our lives, sometimes we are tempted to think, maybe God has failed. Maybe God's plans have failed. Maybe God has just left me to figure out things for myself. Where is God when I experience this pain? But I want to remind you that God, as Lillian told us last week, will never leave us or will never forsake us. And that's why, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul says in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 7 to 10, he says, For that reason, therefore, he says, even though we have these treasures in just of clay, he says, even when we are afflicted, he says, we are not crushed. Because God is with us. He says, even when we are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. Even when we are persecuted, but we know that we are not forsaken because God is always with us. Even when you feel like you are struck down, know that your life is not destroyed because God is with you. And that's why he says he's always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So the picture that Paul gives us here 
He uses a picture of glass of, you know, it says jars of clay. Clay is something that's fragile. And you know, when you think about our lives, you know, we were never meant to be unbreakable. You know, we, we were not created to be independently strong, you know, on our own and of ourselves. We are fragile. And this is because God wants to accomplish something good through our fragility. He wants to allow us, you know, he, he, he allows us to be cracked so that he can fix us. And just, you know, the, Jeremiah talks about the picture of the potter and the clay and, and, the, and, the pot, and, the, and the clay in the hands of the potter. God is molding and just shaping something beautiful out of our life, irrespective of how messy that may look. Because even in the midst of our suffering, God continues to use that to mold and shape us to be the kind of people that we want us to be. So I just want to encourage you right now. You know, I don't know what you're going through. But if, you, if, you fire, if you're going through any affliction, know that you will not be crushed. If you are perplexed, just know that it will not drive you to despair. If you are experiencing any persecution in your place of work, in your family or where, just know that you are not forsaken by God. You know, if you feel like, you know, you're struck down by the challenges of life, know that you will not be destroyed because God is just right there with you. But also that, you know, Paul uses this imagery to remind us too that, you know, even with the fragility of our life, God loves to fill our lives. It's not about us, it's about God. God continues to use our lives no matter how meek, how, 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 how ample and how delicate that can be. God wants to fill us with himself. And God, you know, gives meaning and purpose to our lives. Sometimes even through the things that we go through in our lives that doesn't make sense to us right now. And so the reason why we go through suffering is that God leaves us in this broken world because what it produces in us is far better than the comfortable life that we all want. Rick Warren writes and says that this life here on earth is like a blink of an eye, but it's like he says it's a rehearsal for life in timeless eternity together with God. So I pray that, you know, that God will help you, that you can endure hardship without feeling forsaken, without giving in to despair because God is doing something beautiful out of your life. But just reminding you that this is not the whole story. So don't let suffering rob you of your hope. Don't allow for it to make you feel that you are on your own and you are forsaken. God will never forsake you. God will never leave you. The other reason why God allows suffering is that God uses suffering to transform us. You know, in, in, in James chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4, the Bible says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what the word of God tells us. You know, so God uses suffering. And that's why I say count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Because it's part of God's process of molding and shaping us and transforming us, you know, to be the kind of people that we want us to be. When you think about the life that we live here on earth, you know, there are two different kinds of motivations for hope that, that this world presents to us. And maybe even that we, we, are, we are offered to us as, as human beings and as children of God. You know, and, and we have to choose. You know, this world... You know, the kind of motivation for hope that it offers to us is to put our hope in power, positions, success, maybe, you know, our, strength, our human capacity and strength, maybe our connections and our associations. Sometimes we want to put hope in, in pleasure and just the fleeting things of this world. But, you know, there's the other hope that the Bible offers to us. That, you know, is, 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 is that hope that is rich in spiritual growth and revival. You know, that, that gives us, leads us to progress and that God-glorifying kind of life. And so the Bible actually presents that option not only as individually more satisfying, but also that which we were made for. That God desires that our hope is established in something that nourishes us and grows us spiritually. Something that leads us towards spiritual progress and not stagnation. Something that is God glorifying at all times in our lives. These are the things that the world promises us, like strength, position, power, success. We can put our hope there, but they're just for a while. And we know people who have experienced great positions, but they still suffer, and they suffer without hope. When those things are taken away, when, when all the world is gone, you know, they are left but with nothing. So we need to learn to trust God. Not that it's bad to have some of these things. God blesses us, but that, not to put our hope in these things, but to put our hope in God alone. So suffering, someone say that suffering in the hands of God is a powerful tool for personal growth and transformation. And that's what, you know, the book of James reminds us today. That these various trials, it says, you know, 
the testing of our faith, he says, produces steadfastness and says, when this has had full effect, he says that we may become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is using your suffering, even right now, to produce in you what you could never produce in yourself. <laughs> because most of the times, when we want to avoid any pain and suffering, it's because of the things, you know, it's, it's about us. It's about us. But, you know, sometimes, you know, suffering produces in us what could never, we could never find in and of ourselves. Suffering in the hands of God is used to fill you up, to grow you up, and to complete God's work in you. That is a reminder that we have today. So, and, and, and when we think about the Bible saying, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, it doesn't mean that we become numb to pain and suffering. It doesn't mean that then, you know, we become sadistic and, and that we fail to recognize that there is pain and suffering. No, but that we have the joy to know that God is with us, to know that God is doing something big. And if I cooperate with God through this, he is going to develop something good and something beautiful out of my life. When you and I think we've been forsaken, when you and I maybe uh, feel as if, you know, God is so distant from us, sometimes it's actually because God just wants us to be reminded that we cannot do this life without him. It's an invitation for us to depend on God. It's actually an, a, just a pointer and a reminder in our lives that God is actually doing his work of rescuing us. God is doing his work of transformation in our lives. God is actually doing his work of delivering and freeing us by his power. So, so that is something that we need to think about. And, you know, many times, even as we go through pain and suffering, you know, someone actually pointed out, I say, you know, it's actually God saving us from ourselves. Because many times, you know, we are selfish, we are impatient, we are angry. We are always complaining about things when things don't go right in our lives. But, you know, God wants us to point out beyond ourselves so that we can look up to him. So suffering... When we understand it and the way that we have talked about that God uses it to transform us, suffering, you know, saves us from self-dependence. For a moment when you go through suffering, we realize that, you know, the pain and weaknesses that we go through cause us to cry out to God more authentically and more deeply and, and, and in a more humble way to know that without God, you know, I am I'm done. You know, I cannot manage this by myself. And, you know, pain and suffering reminds us that we were created to have communion with God but also to, to live in community with other believers so that, you know, we don't have this individualism and, and, and self-dependence, but realize that we need to depend on God, but also we need to do life with other people because when we go through pain, just like Job, we need people around us. Even if they may not say anything, but just that ministry of presence means a lot to us because we were not created for ourselves as an island. We were created for communion with God and to live in community with other, with other believers. But suffering also saves us from our spiritual inadequacies. You know, in our pain, you know, pain, you know, reveals the true state of our hearts. When we become so easily angered, we become so irritable, we become so jealous and envious, we become so demanding. You know, it shows, you know, that we are impatient and doubtful and angry. You know, it's not, these things are not brought by suffering into our lives. These are things that in our hearts that suffering just becomes a pointer to reveal that God still needs to do some work in our hearts and in our lives. And so this is what pain and suffering does in our lives. That's how, you know, we can redeem this pain and just say, God, would you use it to be a blessing in my life and to help me to grow to be more and more like Jesus. But also suffering saves us from, you know, it, suffering exposes our idols. You know, there are things that we have held so close and we think that we cannot do life without them. We cannot live without them. And when, when they finally are diminished and taken away from us, we realize that, you know, we, 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 are, we can only have our hope in God and God alone. There are things that we feel we can't live without. And that is what truly rules our hearts. It's not just that we are going through, what we're going through is painful, but it's also that we've lost what was giving value and worth to us. And when God exposes these idols and the powerlessness and uselessness of these things, it for a moment allows us to realize that we need to put our hope in God and God alone. And that's why Job, after all these things, he says, my ears had heard about God, but he says, now my eyes have seen you. And that's, that's the joy that comes to everyone, you know, that, that we need to pray that God will just bring to us, that we will come to a point that we can say like Job, God, I have seen you. And, and that is just the blessing that suffering sometimes offers to us as children of God. The other prison that God allows suffering in our lives, that God uses suffering to prepare us for his service. In 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 1, 
from, from, from verse 3 to 9, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in, our, in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in, in, in comfort too. He says, If we are, we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. And he says, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. This is Paul giving his experience. He says, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired for life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You know, the Apostle Paul, you know, points a very amazing picture. And Pastor Dave, you know, went a great deal to talk about this. So I don't want to belabor so much about this. But you know, every believer, we have been called, every child of God is called to serve God. Every believer is a minister. God calls us to use our gifts and abilities that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit to serve his body. God has called us to minister to other people. So ministry is for every believer. It's not, you know, a volunteerism or something that is just for a few. It is a lifestyle that we've been called to for every one of us as children of God. And you know, God wants us to use our experiences. You know, the things that we've gone through to become a blessing. And you know, what Paul reminds us here is that God never wastes any experiences in our lives. And this is what Paul refers to his own experience. He says in Asia, he says they even thought, thought, thought that they had been sentenced to death. They did not know that they would live again. But God used that experience to be um, an experience that they can use to encourage other people also in the challenges that they go through. And that's why he says, you know, he says God who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those that are in any affliction. You know, I've gone through a lot in my life. The, 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 the challenging things that I've had to go through, the tough times that I've gone through, there are good times and wonderful things that God has done. And I've realized in my ministry over the years that God has actually used even some of the things that I did not in any way as I was going through them, thinking that God can do anything good through some of those things. But now as I speak to people, it's very easy for me to empathize with them. It's very easy for me to feel compassion because I have experienced and gone through similar things. God uses my experience to be a blessing to other people. And that's exactly what God wants us to do, is to know that you know, God uses sufferings to make us both willing and ready to be part of what he's doing in the life of other people who are around us. And so that means that you know, for God, suffering has ministry in perspective. And, and, and your hardships and suffering qualify you to be part of the most wonderful and important work in the universe to serve God and to use it to, to, to be a blessing to other people. So God uses your stories and God gives us stories. Stories of how God met us in, the most, in our most trying moments, in our panic and fear, and how God ministered hope and light and, and God helps us to, to use that to lift, us, to lift others up, to give us hope, to, to bring peace in the hearts of others and to meet the needs of other people. So this is why, and, and you know, God uses that. You know, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, we have the amazing story of Joseph. When his brother sold him and they let him, you know, go, you know, these guys, you know, ultimately looks, you know, with hindsight, he looks back and says, you know what, guys, you meant it for evil. But he says, God meant it for good. So there are many things, you know, John Piper, and I think I've said this before, he says, God does not use anyone greatly until he has tested them deeply. You know, part of how God prepares us for service is that he allows us to go through these means. And know that, you know, when we are faithful in the difficult times in our lives, God knows that even in the good times, we are going to be faithful to him. So may God help you that, you know, you would use your stories. What are the stories of suffering and comfort that God has given you so that you can use it to be an encouragement to other people? Lastly, is that God uses suffering to remind us that this is not our home. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 16 to chapter 5, verse 5, it says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting, this body, it says our inner self is being renewed day by day. For, in, for this light momentary affliction, the challenges that we go through right now, it says it's preparing us for eternal weight of glory. Beyond all comparison, it says as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
He says, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are, are, are unseen are eternal. He says, for we know that if the tent, which is this, you know, bodies that we have, he says, for if we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but a tunnel in the heavens. He says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting on it on, he says, we may be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, he says, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, he says, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he says, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. You know, friends, this world is not our home. We are just passers by. We are just pilgrims. And God, you know, uses suffering to remind us that this is not our permanent home. We are just but passers by. When you live with the here and now, you know, perspective, you want this life to be as comfortable as you want it to be. You want that things to be predictable. And that's why, you know, we visit some of these people. Because, you know, we want to be in control. You know, we want life to be as comfortable and pleasurable and successful and enjoyable as possibly it can be. And that's why, you know, one of the, you know, slogans of this generation is YOLO. You know, you can only, you can only live one. So it's basically, you know, just enjoy life because this is all that it is. But friends, that is not true. God is doing in the here and now. What God is doing in the here and now is, is working to prepare us for a final destination. So this is just to remind us, there's a better place. All the hardships and laws we face are designed to, by God to prepare us for our eternal home. God is working through hardships to free uh, to, you know, to just make our hands free, not to hold anything so tightly and to loosen our hands so that we don't trust, you know, temporal things so much is working to release us from the hope that this present world will ever be paradise that our hearts long for. There is something more beautiful that our hearts need to long for. Our hearts need to have a deep longing and a great desire for a better place and, and, and just the presence of God himself. So I want to just remind you today, this is not the end of the story. And as you go through whatever you're going through, I hope that God reminds you that ultimately Jesus says, you know, in Revelation, the Bible says, we are going to a place where there will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. It will just be a place of rejoicing. So this pain and suffering we go through right now is just a reminder that this is not the final story. And I pray that this brings some eager anticipation and excitement in your heart to want to trust God, to want not to miss out on this wonderful plan that God has for you. And you know, friends, the only way we can get to enjoy an etern you know, timeless eternity with God forever is through the offering that God has made himself through his son. And that is through Jesus. We have a wonderful perspective to go through life and even in through pain and suffering. That we don't just go through it like every other person who does not know God. We see God even working his purpose through this. So I pray that if you've never given your life to Jesus, that you will trust him. If you've been wavering in your faith and in your belief in Jesus, that you will go back and just trust God and let him handle the steering wheel of your life and know that he knows the right destination where he needs to take your life. He will fill your life with meaning and purpose and help you to live a meaningful, fruitful life because that's what he always desired for you. So may God bless you. and know that whatever it is that you're going through, God is using it for his glory. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. To be reminded that, Lord, Nothing that happens is just a work of faith, happens by accident. Oh Lord, Lord, it's not because you have failed or your plan has failed. But God, that you are in control of everything. And Lord, even when you go through the most trying moments in our lives, God, you have never left us because you promise and your word is true that you will never leave us or forsake us. Help us, Father, that we will cooperate with you. And that's just ask Holy Spirit, God, would you just help me to know what is it that you're doing? What is it that you're wanting me to learn? Lord, how are you growing me? through what I'm going through right now. So Lord, we just offer our lives to you, offer our situation and everything that you're going through and just say, God, take control. Have your way and do your will. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you so much. Thank you so much for joining with us today. May God bless you and uh, hope to see you again next week. God bless you.